Hello, I'm Dylan. And I'm Keon. And this is Zenith, that podcast where we lie our way into the army because this week we watched Power Play. Written by Terry Nation. Directed by, allegedly, David Maloney. <laughs> and aired on January 14th, 1980. Right. So I believe, uh, Doctor Who-wise, we're at the end of Power of Cruel... No, Horns no. of Naimon. We're after Horns of Naimon, during the time in which yeah. Sharda would have been aired, but because Sharda was never completed because of the industrial action, like we talked about last week, uh, we're actually technically once again in the inter-season yeah. era of Doctor Who. Yep. Horns of Naimon, great story. Really? Uh, had yeah, the Minotaur in. I would say so, yeah. Had the Minotaur played by David Prowse in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thanks for remembering to bring up Doctor Who every week, because I forget every week. <laughs> I make a note to myself now, because this is the only way I'm going to remember. Anyway, Terry Nation, back again. Terry Nation wrote back last week's again. story, right? It was like Chris Batcher. E- ter- yeah, it was... Oh, man, I don't remember. I okay. think it was Terry Nation. Check. I think it was Terry Nation as well, but, you know, we'll check. Aftermath. Uh, it was Terry Nation. Yeah. Okay, that's weird then, because this story felt a lot weaker than Aftermath to me, but anyway. I liked this. I didn't think it was as good as Aftermath, because again, Aftermath is my favorite episode of Lake 7. But... Yeah, no, me too. I liked this. I thought it was weaker than Aftermath, yeah. though. Yeah, yep. But anyway. I liked how there were like three things going on in this one, and they all sort of, at least two of them sort of converged. I mean, I liked that, but it seemed like all three of them were rather lazily written and i feel like if mm. terry nation had condensed it to maybe two separate plot threads it would have been a lot stronger because I mean, he would have been able to dedicate more time to them i mean yeah if you think of the villi, villa uh, villi and calla no if you think of the villa and cali stuff as sort of one thing and then the avon stuff is sort of just its own thing that's sort of a typical blake seven thing to do yeah. it feels a lot stronger because i mean it is a, the cali and villa's story is a simple story which isn't bad to me it's just simple. it is but until they like join up, it feels like both of them are just really. But that's more. Eh. That's also more the B plot. The Avon stuff is more, sort of what's you know the main focus of what's going on. And I I did really like the stuff on the Liberator. Yeah, I mean, me too. I would have just preferred maybe if Callie and Villa had started together at the start of the story, and then, uh, in had my opinion, that would have just that would have just know. been a stronger story to me because then we could have had more focus on the two plot threads. Because at the beginning of the story, until about halfway through. We're splitting between the Avon and Dana, and then Villa. It's, it's like and a fifty-fifty split. Between, well, it's basically a fifty-fifty split between stuff with Avon and Dana, and then the other fifty percent is Villa and Cali stuff. Mm-hmm. So like twenty-five. It's, it's more like, probably thirty-five percent Villa, fifteen percent Cali. If we're going to be breaking it down that way. Yeah, but I think it would have been preferred more if it was Villa and Cali. If it was together. less Villa, more Cali. <laughs> well, because it also would have been like a nice parallel because you have Avon and Dana getting 50% and then you would have Villa and Cali as the other duo. It'd be like two kind of duos. Yeah, it makes sense. I, I liked Villa being like dumb. I thought he was like, I thought Villa was clued into what's, what was going on here, but apparently not. <laughs> No, <laughs> kind of made his character weaker in my opinion. I, I kind of wanted Callie there to be like, Villa, you're an idiot. Well, also, Villa is... Because it seems like Callie Villa, wasn't read into anything either. Yeah, but like, has Villa... Just ignoring Callie for a minute, because there's uh, some stuff to say about Callie too, but like, has Villa ever been this this gullible? No. He's been the one who's like the most skeptical of everything. Yeah, yeah. This is, is I mean, it, up until now, like, we even said Villa was the one who basically challenged everything Blake was saying was always the voice of reason, because he was always like skeptical. <laughs> yeah. And in this story, he just goes along with everything. Yeah. That's why I thought up until like... Which is going to be my what would Blake do moment <laughs> later in the story. That's why I thought like up until almost the very end that Villa had like a plan or something or that he at least knew what was going on or knew it was yeah. dangerous. But I guess that's not the case. I mean, we can go into that more in a little bit when we've actually explained what's go- going on. But we start immediately where we left off with Avon and Dana on the Liberator. If I didn't know this was going to happen, I would have been extremely surprised at this. Because <laughs> I know I wouldn't because last week is like an actual cliffhanger, you know. I guess so. But they're being held at gunpoint by Del Tarrant and mm-hmm. Clegg. Yeah, Have, haven't we had someone named Clegg on this show before? Because I heard him say his name Clegg, and I'm like, I know that name. Probably, yeah. We've and had- it's not like I know somebody in real life <laughs> named Clegg, right? <laughs> it's a it's a last name. I wouldn't be like shocked if someone had the last name Clegg, right? Mm-hmm. So I don't know if we've seen someone named Clegg before. We have seen someone named Dev Tarrant. We've also had someone <laughs> named Del Grant. Oh, yeah, right. We talked about this last week, actually. 
I didn't. So. I didn't see the the twist. You know, every, every time I think I know every twist and everything about Blake Seven, there's always something more to surprise me or something more to spoil me. I didn't. I did not know what was going to happen with Del Tarrant later on. Oh, I pinned it as soon as the first guard was dead. I was like, that's probably Tarrant. <laughs> well, was that like? Did you? What clued you in, or was it just a lucky guess? What clued me in was that Tarrant becomes a member of the Liberator crew. Oh. If I had, didn't know that, I wouldn't have known until he reveals it. But as the instant the first guard is dead, I'm like, okay, Tarrant is just going to kill all the Federation group. Wow. <laughs> anyway, they bring Dana and Avon into the uh, control room because the Avon... Uh, what's the line from Avon? That this, that's how Del Tarrant, like, the line he uses to... Uh, like, speculate, but also he's right... I forget what it is. Oh, man. I don't know what it is. Tarrant says later that he figures out it was Avon because oh, he right. would have he recognized... Says your ship. He, he's like, what are you doing on our ship? And Avon goes, like, your ship? Mm-hmm. As if he already knows, like, who sh- whose ship it was. Whereas, yeah. like, if he is who he says he was, which is just a Federation civilian, he wouldn't Married question to Dana. it. Married to Dana, right. He wouldn't question it. Right. But anyway, they take him to the bridge because Tarrant says Zen is apparently only key to work for the crew of the Liberator, which I don't think we ever actually saw happen on the show, but anyway. There's because a lot, we, there's in, a lot in, we didn't see happen on the show. In, in Bounty, doesn't, uh, what's his name? Tarvin. Tarvin talk I, with I, Zen? No, I, I do don't not remember, remember at actually. all. Actually, no, maybe I'm misremembering. But like, that's also something they could have set up at any time, and there's plenty of stuff even indicated in this episode that we don't see on screen. Orak doesn't show up in the story, by the way. Yeah. They take them to the bridge because they want to check the voice prints in Zen because if they Zen don't... responds to them, then they know that they're the Liberator crew. Of course, it doesn't right. respond to Dana because Dana is not part of the Liberator crew yet. Yeah, Avon is actually doing a really bad job lying here. <laughs> Which is surprising because Avon was usually the most cunning person. <laughs> I mean, this is like something that... Th- this is part of like the, the switch between Blake and Avon, right? Like mm-hmm. Avon is becoming the more hero-esque character. Right. And, you know, we've speculated before and like his his tough facade is like it's just it's a it is that it's a facade. It's a facade. But I mean he's doing like a really poor job. Like yeah. this is freshman level line. <laughs> yeah. Dana's and, doing a better job because she has less to lie about. <laughs> yeah, she's actually not part of the Liberated crew. So when they're like, are you part of the crew of the ship? She could legitimately be like, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> what surprises me is that they didn't... What surprises me now that I'm thinking about it, and I didn't think about this when I was watching the episode, because Avon tells them that they were they were on like another ship and their life pod docked with the Liberator... I'm surprised now that they didn't like point out the Liberator teleporter brace that's attached to their wrists. Yeah, I mean, maybe I don't know. They probably didn't know or notice or whatever. Unless they removed them when we weren't looking, or unless I missed a scene where they removed them. I don't know. I mean, Villa and Callie were definitely wearing them. Callie tries to contact them multiple times Mm -hmm. and only does so once. Well, we know Avon and Dana were wearing them when they beamed up because they had had that scuffle over it at the end of Aftermath with Serverland. Yeah. It's not like that important of a thing. They either just didn't notice or they took them off or they didn't know what they were or something like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, (laughs) Del Tarrant, actually, you know, Dana, they get Dana to to say the line or whatever and Zen doesn't respond and Avon's about to say it. Del Tarrant just punches him. Yeah, Del Tarrant just clocks him over the head with his gun. And Clegg is like, why did you do... He asks Tarrant why he did that and he's like, well, I saw him reaching for a gun but Clegg can't find any sort of gun on Avon Mm -hmm. and... Del Tarrant was like, well... Topical. Oh, uh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> but Del sort of was like, well, I could have sworn I saw him reaching for something, so you better thank me that your head's still intact. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, Del Tarrant is a higher-ranking member than Clegg, so... That's what he says. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, according to the uniform... Yeah. Dana then... Clegg doesn't like that, though. You know, he's yeah. really on Tarrant's case. He's on a mutiny... Kind of like Ed in Waters of Mars. <laughs> anyway, Dana, when they get thrown in, in the room where they're being kept, Dana complains that she should have been able to take them because there's only two of them. And Avon's like, yeah, and there are four more around the corner. She's like, I could have killed them. And Avon's like, yeah, maybe. But one of us would be dead too. So probably wasn't worth it. Right. They also have some more time to think about what's going on, but they decided to break out for now. 
They decide to break out for now. <laughs> <laughs> they do. I mean, they just they're like, well, let's figure out what. Well, to do so they to get because they hear from Del Tarrant when he's explaining the whole thing about the Liberator computers that they, that Zen is registering some sort of voice print from somewhere, but yeah, they, they don't know, know where. So they want one of them to like activate Zen so they can find out where they're going because Zen is taking the Liberator to somewhere or someone. Yeah, they know it's someone from Blake's crew. Mm-hmm. They know that it's Blake's you know ship or whatever, but. Was Blake? Was ship. yeah, was. We get info about Blake and Jenna in this episode as well. Mm-hmm. Um, this is why this later. this episode is also like not as much as aftermath. I'd have to probably watch this again, but this is also about like reported speech and like what, like how belief like even works, and it's done like a meta level. Also, like what you believe in a TV show and who you believe it from, and like what the circumstances of that well, are. I guess incredibly more meta when Del Tarrant reveals that he's been stabbing Federation crews behind everyone's back. Sure. Yeah. And then you yeah, have, it actually does. Wow, yeah. And then you have to wonder, like, what's his end game, so to speak, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, but really, if he he was part of the the Federation on the ship, he could have easily had Avon speak to Zen. Then they could have just had Avon yeah, hand well, over Zen to them and then kill them, and then he would have control of this incredibly powerful ship, but instead he backstabs the Federation. So you have to sure. wonder what his endgame is. Maybe he's thinking, I don't, this, I'm just guessing, maybe he's thinking that he's going to get found out eventually, and it's easier to join in with Avon and Dana. Possibly. But meanwhile, Villa is injured, and he's on a planet in a, in a sort of forest area. Yeah. He's pretend, He's making it out like he has like this whole platoon of guys. Because he hears someone coming, and he's like, all, all right, right, men. I'm going to count to 10 and these other people are going to go away. <laughs> He's like, I'm going to give them till 10 to, to leave and then open fire or whatever. But it's just this one guy. I'm glad to see Patrick Stewart is still alive and hundreds or thousands of years from now. No. <laughs> no, he doesn't look that much like Patrick Stewart. No, he doesn't. And especially since Patrick Stewart has looked the same since like the 80s. <laughs> well, because didn't Patrick Stewart have that disease that made him go bald at like 13 or something? I don't know. I yeah. thought you were going to say, didn't Patrick Stewart make a deal with the devil not to age? <laughs> Because it looks like he hasn't aged since the 80s. Yeah, I don't know. He's aged very gracefully. And if I can age half as gracefully as Patrick Stewart, I'll be happy. (laughs) Anyway, this guy captures Villa and he's like, you're going to come with us. Villa has like a broken arm of some sort. Yeah, he has a broken arm. Not sure how that happened. So he says, like, maybe it's just scratched and he's like, it's broken. (laughs) Villa's a bit of a fool in this episode. (laughs) I believe him on this point. I don't sure. think he's smart enough to pretend his arm is broken. <laughs> they get joined up by another guy. Yeah, who has no lines. He's like the Gan of Series C. <laughs> Here's our what would Gan do moment. <laughs> Be this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Be this guy. <laughs> but the 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 guy the bald guy sort of uh, explains what's going on in sort of vague terms. The his people are hunted. We don't really see his people other than him and this other guy, but they're being hunted by the high techs. As soon as I heard this name, I just wanted to keel over and die. As soon as I heard this name, I was like, "Did Terry Nation write this story?" Because I wasn't paying attention when in the credits or whatever. And then you checked, and yep, like, it yeah, was Terry Nation. Yeah. He didn't even try with this one. <laughs> I mean, look, it's not like at least that with he tried. Deal. It's not that big of a deal. It is something that like makes you think. Like, okay, well, here's here's the thing. It wasn't that big of a deal until Villa, they like expl- yeah, yeah, that's until what they explained it. Worse. But like, also <laughs> makes you think like they the high techs later on are like we're you know our descendants came from Earth and I was like maybe they the name high techs comes from like Texans and they're like from Northern Texas. I don't know. It's spelled T E C H. Yeah, but it could have been corrupted or changed or whatever. Spelling is really weird and dumb, especially in English. Then they could have done like a Seva team kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Which they didn't. The Tesh. The High Tesh. There you go. <laughs> Except they didn't. It's the High Tex. Yeah. You know, maybe they are. Maybe they're from Texas. Maybe they have their 10-gallon... High Tex gallon, Mex. Maybe they have their 10-gallon hats at the ready... They have like and deployable, they're remembering the Alamo. No, okay. I deployable don't know. ten gallon hats. <laughs> they did have those hats, hats that made me think of Black Manta from Aquaman. <laughs> All right, but anyway, there's some sort of drone-like things patrolling the woods now. 
oh yeah because then the bald guy gets hit in the head with a spear and then villa's like yeah is he it's dead? like a dart it's like a dart is he dead and i'm like no villa he just got hit with a spear in the face he's still but alive he's, but then you find yeah, out that a tranquilizer darts so yeah they're drug I'm the guns fool here. the things that look like drones are actually just guns that are huge and make a lot of noise and have and can fly Light. and be autonomous. Well, I don't know. I don't think they were flying. I think it was just shot really weirdly because later on they're Maybe. holding those big guns and that's what it is. But they're called drug guns and they're just tranks, I guess. Yeah, I guess. Usually they would take them in because they, they hunt these sort of, they, they call them primitives. They hunt the primitives for Once bounty. Again, topical. Um, I mean, sure. There's also this thing in this where once a villa gets, once he meets the high techs, he... They're like, oh, you speak our language. And I was like, yeah, I guess the, the primitives speak your language as well because Villa yeah. communicates with both of them. I guess they don't know that, which is like really weird. And there's probably more to say about they that. They scanned Villa and they somehow found out he's not a primitive by scanning him. They also look at his clothes and they're like, he's not a primitive. But like apparently the, the high techs and the primitives speak the same language and they just don't know that. I mean, this is very clearly colonialism, right? I mean, yeah. The things that the high techs tell Villa is like straight out of colonialism 101 playbook. Yeah, sure. Like we're coming here to basically educate these species and not species, these people. We're going to take them and integrate them into our society, which yeah, is clearly their, superior. Yeah, it's for their own good. Yeah, for their own good, right. which is once again, straight out of colonialism 101. Yeah, there's this poem by, God, who, uh, who wrote Jungle Book? Ru- uh, was that yeah, Rudy, Kipling? yeah, Rudyard Kipling called Us and Them, which is like, and uh, obviously, if you know anything about him, he was like a huge colonialist. I was going to say, wasn't he like a huge racist? Yeah, yeah he was. <laughs> but I like the poem. I mean, I don't necessarily agree with like its rhetoric. I don't necessarily agree with like what's in the poem. I like the poem. I don't think you have to agree with something to like it. No, you don't. My opinion, anyway. Although I think I don't think, I think, should... I think agreeing or disagreeing with it can affect how much you like it. But I don't think right. Like, I think if you disagree with it, that, disagree with it that, that doesn't mean you have to automatically dislike it, in my right. opinion. And I don't think we should, like, just to make myself clear, I don't think we should prop up, like, a poem like this, mm-hmm. especially if you, like, you, you know, examine, like, what it's actually saying. I don't think we yeah. should, like, prop it up as, like, something great, but, like, yeah. I mean, I like, like, as a poem, like, I like it. Mm-hmm. It's probably important in history and stuff, but, like, yeah. <laughs> if you get what I'm saying. I, don't I get know. what you're saying. Yeah. Anyway, back on the Liberator. People are dying. We get well, these so first-person shots. <laughs> Avon and Dana go to escape, and the guard just has a knife in his back. And like, what well, wasn't us? Let's just take his gun and go uh, escape. Yeah. And then immediately Which, the guards run in. And they're like, I ah, killed his own knife. Must have been Avon and Dana. What's weird, and now I, I can see why this is the case, but Del Tarrant has a really weird line here. He's like, he says, must have gone off on him. Like, he accidentally, like, shot himself or the gun mm-hmm. malfunctioned or something. Well, he was stabbed. stabbed. He was stabbed. And now, it, like, after watching the episode, it's clear, like, that since Tarrant killed yeah. him, he's, like, just making this up as he goes along. <laughs> like, in the moment, I was like, what? He was stabbed with a knife. <laughs> Tarrant's just <laughs> winging it, so to speak. <laughs> So, Man, I thought it was five four one two four this whole time. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, Avon and Dana eventually make it to this control room, and uh, well, they Avon, make it and they go down to the, like the well, service they, duct things. Yeah, and then they get to this maintenance room of some sort, and and Avon makes it look like they launched a life pod. Right. And then they go back and hide in the room that they were originally put in because Avon's like, where's the place you would last look for us? And she's like, the place we were get, like captured in. And he's like, yep, exactly. Yeah. And then after that, Avon goes to the bridge and he talks with Zen uh, and he gets all this information. Uh, he first asks about Blake. I don't remember what he says about Blake. That he's safe or something like that. He, Blake and Jenna are safe. Well, he asks about Jenna and the and Zen says she's sustained like superficial injuries, but she's okay. And she's signaled not to make her yeah. rescue a priority. Or Which ever, this, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is my what would Blake do for this episode because even though um, Zen tells Avon that Villa is injured and that he's the priority for who they're going to go pick up first, I don't know. I think Blake, like at least latter half of series B Blake, would be like, all right, we got to go pick up Jenna or, or Callie maybe. Or Avon if we swap Avon right, and Blake in right. this situation. Yeah, I think Blake, you know, again, in the latter half of series B, just looking at them as tools and stuff mm-hmm. would definitely want to go for... Jenna, the tool Avon. with the most use. Yeah, exactly. You're not going to go for your, you know, in your this weakest metaphor, link. <laughs> Villa is like the, the I don't know. The guy who's like usually always right, but like. 
He's like the hacksaw over in the corner, the like really specific specific use hacksaw. Then like Avon is like a multi purpose like Swiss Army knife. I mean Jenna's like a Jenna's like a solid fifty uh, percent Swiss Army knife. Jenna's also the one who like always stood behind Blake, like basically no matter what, which really strengthened his yeah. position. I mean you're not gonna go for the for the hacksaw, you're gonna go for the Swiss Army knife. It's a really big Swiss Army knife that has a hacksaw in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. And then Avon quickly makes a break for it back yeah, well, when Avon, he gets captured. Actually. Yeah, Avon hears people coming, so I guess he accepts going for Villa. But he also hears people coming. He's like, oh, shoot, got to run. Yeah, but well, they've actually captured Dana. He, yeah, Avon yeah. doesn't realize that. Clegg and his men, that is. Yeah. Tarrant isn't really a part of this. But as Avon is going back to wherever he, or he's just running through the corridors, actually, and he sees a, a guy coming out of the treasure room. This is mm-hmm. the closest we've seen to the treasure room. <laughs> Still don't see it, but he comes out. He's holding a bag of jewels. Dang oh. it, so close. <laughs> Are we going to see the treasure room before Blake 7 ends? Let's, put, gonna, this yeah, poll, let's, let's put this poll up on Twitter or something. Well, people already know, but we can we can guess, and my guess is going to be no. My guess is no. <laughs> All right, then. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if we're right. <laughs> But meanwhile, we also get some stuff with Callie. Callie is... Um, Barely anything right now, though. But with but Servalan also shows up, which is interesting. So Callie is on this, like, sick bay ship. These people... This hospital ship. Hospital ship. She's been trying to contact the Liberator, but she doesn't want the hospital staff to see the bracelet and yeah. and figure out what it is and who she is. But Servalan also shows up. Yeah, they're like, oh, we're picking up a very special guest, and it's Servalan. She's like, what's up? <laughs> it's me, Servalan. Servalan's like turning into the master on Doctor Who where she just shows up. <laughs> and then loses and runs away. <laughs> yeah, basically, although she kind of wins at, at some capacity, at least she says in this. Well, she because she thinks she starts she's won, winning. But then Villa and, and Callie beam out. So. But she also does reclaim at least a little bit of power. Yeah. Well, so with Villa, Villa gets captured by the high techs, and this is my what would Blake do moment because Villa just completely goes along with the high techs at this point because they start feeding him. They like patch up his arm, and he's like, "Man, this is great." If this was Blake. He'd be like, "No, no, no, I don't trust you," because you know Blake. Blake for Blake some was really trusting. Blake was really trusting, but he was always trusting of the first people he met. So he would have trusted. Right, yeah, met these, that's true. He would have met these <laughs> primitives, be like, "Man, these primitives are obviously right." And then the high tech would have shown up and be like, "I don't trust you at all," because he would have been totally on the side of these primitives already. Yeah, yeah, basically. Would have slapped the food out of their hand. Like, don't touch me. <laughs> you don't have permission to touch Blake. <laughs> you don't have permission to touch God Empress, <laughs> Empress God Emperor <laughs> Blake. <laughs> Raj Blake. God Emperor Raj Blake. But Villa goes along with it. Again, I was still holding out the idea that he was skeptical of them because there is something very suspicious about them. There's something very suspicious about the way Villa's acting, too. They're also wearing capes, which is interesting. Yeah, there is something suspicious about the way Villa's acting, which again is like, makes you think that he's skeptical. Except not really. As they get to the, the hospital ship and they start pampering them. This is a little bit later. I'm just going to go over it now, though. Because yeah, this is hard. It's hard to explain this, like, in the actual order that it happened. And it's actually it, not that important, so. It bounces around a lot. But he gets to the place and then. He meets Callie there. Yeah, Callie. And Callie's like, we should contact a little bit. And Villa's like, oh, can't we stay a few more days? And Callie's like, no. <laughs> but Callie actually has is starting to develop, like, she's starting to become, like, more of an empath. Because mm-hmm. she's like, I felt, I knew you were alive, Villa, because I felt your pain. And like, they don't actually go into like what that would do to a person. There are plenty of stories out there that do. Uh, they don't actually, in this episode at least, go into like what that would do to a person, but. Not enough time, really. Not enough time, and there's other stuff to do. But it's there. It's something that they bring up. They bring, we'll just go over what happens to Villa and Callie in total right yeah. now. So they bring them into a room. Servalan comes in. She explains how she's sort of leveraged power. She's contacted the head of this facility or whatever. And she's going to supply them with stuff that they need. And oh, by the way, this is a, an organ bank. Colloquially, it's known as a slaughterhouse. <laughs> and Villa's like, I can't move. And then Because they, like, they drug them. They give them some supposedly vitamins, but it's... they. I guess I'm sort of tranquilizing thing. Callie's face looks like she's not able to move either, but then you just see her right arm like move really obviously from her leg off her leg. Yeah, maybe it has something to do with her supernatural powers. That's how I explained it away to myself. It's like, yeah, Callie's just telepathic, so like, yeah. 
Fine to me. They're about to die, and they get beamed up. That's like at the end of the episode. Mm-hmm. So and it's shot like. The way they achieve it, I'm guess I don't know what kind of effect it is. It's like CSO, possibly. Probably CSO. But it's done like the way they're lying down makes it look like really strange. Just like it, it makes them basically when they teleport into the Liberator, they look like mini, like they look like dolls in the teleport area. Might have been actual Cali and Villa dolls. No, I don't, I don't think it, it was. No, I don't think it was. Doubt it. On the Liberator, Avon is held at gunpoint by the guy he found mm-hmm. coming out of the treasure room. Yeah. And Terrence also there. And Avon tries, he, Avon's like, oh shoot, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. So he, tr- uh, he tries to turn them against each other by telling Terrence that, uh, look, this guy stole from the treasure room. He's probably the one who's been killing The guy who killed and, the guy. And then they, he, they get into a scuffle and Terrence shoots the Federation guy. And then Terrence goes, yep, knew it wasn't him because it was actually me. <laughs> They was like, what? It was <laughs> what? me who killed everyone. And I, I, I really liked this because every time Blake 7 throws like a plot twist at me that I, I mean, I, I don't value plot twists probably as much as most people do. But every time it throws something at me that I didn't like spoil for myself weeks ago, I'm like, yeah, awesome. And I didn't know about this. I didn't know about this at all. I mean, like I said, I guessed it was going to be 10 at the yeah. instant the first guard was dead. Yeah. But if I didn't know that Tant was going to be a member of the Liber- Liberator crew, then I wouldn't have been able to guess at all. Right. And I would have been completely shocked and awed. So Taryn explains the situation, how he after he was like caught up in the war. Yeah, he was he, just a private citizen, apparently. And he, long story short, there's more to this than what I'm going to explain, but I don't necessarily remember all the details of it. He basically managed to infiltrate the Federation. It was his only option, I think. He, well, his life pod got docked with like a Federation vessel, but the guy was dead. So he stole his uniform and right. then basically he stole his uniform and forged his way into the Federation army and then landed on this ship separately from Clegg and his men. Right. That's why there's sort of a power struggle between him and Clegg because they don't really know each other. Clegg mm-hmm. was apparently there first. Yeah. But Del Tarrant has a higher rank Supposedly. according to the uniform right. that he stole. And thanks to the paper thin walls of the Liberator, there's a guy outside listening to them. The legitimately paper thin <laughs> walls, because this is the BBC and it's probably actually butcher paper. <laughs> thanks, system. You know they're the most powerful like people we've seen, and they can't make a, a wall. This is actually kind of funny to it's me. A metaphor the li- for the BBC. The, the Liberator has kidding. like paper thin walls that you can just hear people through. I never realized that you could just stand outside the door on the Liberator. Well, remember when they are like checking? I don't remember what episode this was in. But they're like Blake was like, "Everyone ready?" And everyone's like, "Yup, yup." And then from the other room, Gan's like, "Yup." <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the Liberator is just really echoey. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> so when you talk... You can hear it, and there's no, yeah, no secrets on the Liberator. You, <laughs> if you say something, everyone can hear it. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I don't even want to think about the implications of that. Yeah, but then Avon, Avon, I guess, realizes, because he's been on the Liberator forever, realizes that there's paper-thin walls, <laughs> so if someone's standing outside, he probably knows everything now. Well, they run outside because they realize the guy's outside and they try to shoot him, but they're unsuccessful. And Avon is holding a Federation gun, you know, the ones with the sort of long extended parts on the back. And he still holds it and like yep, a six shooter. He still does. I, made a, I even made an explicit note about that in my notes. Avon's still holding guns like a six shooter. And like, this isn't that big of a deal when you really think about it. I just wish you would stop doing it. <laughs> like, it's not, it doesn't... It's, it's not again, that big of a deal. I just want him to stop. No, it's like, really, it's not that big of a deal, but like, it would be better if he didn't do it, is what I'm trying to say. It just looks out of place is the thing. But at this point, he's done it so much, it is in place. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at this point, if he doesn't do it, we're going to be like, whoa, he didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I bet that's going to happen at some point. We're going to be like, wow, Avon no, didn't hold it like a six shooter. And the thing is, now that he, he's, since he does it, since Paul Darrow does it consistently, whether he does it or not, we're going to notice whether he does it or not. Basically. Damn it, Paul. <laughs> basically, we have a we basically have a whole segment on the show now called Did Avon Hold His Gun Like a Six Shooter This Week or Not? <laughs> and you, I mean, it, we can just actually basically sum that up as did Avon hold a gun or not? Because if he did, he, he held it like a six shooter. <laughs> did Avon hold a gun this week? I almost want to put like a proper musical interlude in there. Like, 
dun, 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 dun. did Avon hold a gun this week? And then just, yes, play out the musical interlude. I mean, now that he's the main character, the answer is probably going to be yes for most of the stories. Most. Most. What happens when it's no? Yeah. And a wah, wah, oh, yeah. sound effect. <laughs> <laughs> With live production, you know, coming up with the future of the show. I Actually, I had this question in my notes. This is sort of out of place, but did Villa ever meet Servaland before this? I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, obviously he knows who she is, but the wiki, on screen The wiki least. page for Servaland actually like lists how many times she meets each member of the Liberator crew. So Probably we, shouldn't like read that in depth because it's going to spoil stuff, but... I guess. I if mean, you don't care, it probably doesn't matter. Like, uh, This is not <clears throat> on this page. I, thought, hmm. I remember seeing once a list of how many times Servaland meets each meets each character. Yeah. I'll have to see if I can find it. Yeah, I mean, they probably met off screen or whatever. There's obviously plenty of stuff that happens on the show that we don't see. So. There's also plenty of expanded material now. Yeah. All audios. That don't feature Gareth Thomas because he has passed. Yep. Just a few years ago, he passed away, I think 2014 or 15. Mm-hmm. I think he was actually in some of the audios before he passed, though. Yeah. So So they, they come up with this plan because Dana's being held hostage, basically. By Clegg. By Clegg. And they come up with this plan to save her. Rather convoluted plan. It works though. It's it's. I think it's a good plan. Avon goes in. and He tells Clegg to basically just like we can capture Tarrant by like pretending that I've captured you, and then he'll come in and you can just like capture corner him. him. Right. And so he fires off. A sh- yeah. And then they they do that. Tarrant's like he comes in and he gets sort of supposedly <laughs> held allegedly up. upset at Avon. Yeah. But it was all just a ruse. They then re backstab Clegg. Re backstab. <laughs> yeah. Game of backstab. <laughs> backstab seven. Is that what this show is going to be now that Avon is in charge? If Paul Darrow has anything to say. Then... Well, Avon and Del Tarrant. Oh, yeah. Well, Del Tarrant, Tarrant I've read. supposed to be the Blake replacement. Well, I've read. I don't know how true this is. Obviously, it's just an opinion. But I've read that since Avon fills in the role of, you know, the main character or whatever. And I assume based on what we find out, because we find out what planet Blake is on or like. There's mm-hmm. a name of a planet or something. I assume they're going to spend a few episodes like looking for him. For Blake? Yeah, which is actually nice and sort of interesting because the show is like, I think this is a good thing. It's like losing its episodic nature, basically. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen next week, but like these, this is a different two-parter. There seems to be more of a running like. I mean, but I want thing. it to maintain some of that episodic. I think it's maintaining ness. some of it. I don't want it to become too serialized because I think if it gets lost in the serialization, then it starts to lose like... The charm of, like, the what charm it is. Because of a lot of, like, you know, Series B, you know, they spent half the season trying to find the... Star 1 and then half trying to find the whatever the other one was. Yeah, they spent the first half trying to find the thing that was on Earth. But they, like, what was kind of, like, charming and what made it more believable to me and more enjoyable to me was that along the way they had these random encounters that they couldn't have predicted for. Yeah. And I don't want them to, like, lose that. I don't want it to be, like, a solid, like, three episodes where every episode the plot revolves around finding blake right the end of series b was kind of like that because we got we got gambit where they're looking for the brain print and then we get the keeper well the gambit where they're looking for the location and the keeper where they're looking for the brain print and then star one where they find it and that to me like by the end of it i was like okay thank you know we're still technically going on that plot thread because then we get aftermath which is the aftermath yeah, and then we true. have this which yep. is straight after it yeah i mean and at this point next week i kind of want like a a short reprieve from that before we go straight back into the... I mean, I'm not. I'm just speculating here. I'm not 100% sure. I don't think you're going to get the reprieve that you want necessarily. And I don't know. I'm, I'm on board with it. Like we mentioned before, Series C is like, it's doing different things. And I, I kind of want to see where it goes. I mean, I want to see where it goes, but I really just hope it doesn't lose that episodic well, we'll nature. Well, we'll have to see. I mean, if, if it sounds like I know what's like going to happen in terms of this, I don't. So... <laughs> Despite all the things I've spoiled about this show. I mean, I know the show ends on an episode called Blake, so I have a feeling Blake is going to be making a reappearance sometime. Don't think... Didn't you already spoil the last episode, though? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Not all of it. Okay. I'm not going to say anything. I don't know what exactly you spoiled. I have spoiled all of it, basically. Yeah, you probably shouldn't say anything then. (laughs) I've only spoiled parts of it. I've only spoiled the final scene, so. 
Anyway, Avon and Tamad then beam up Callie and Villa and right as they're about to get killed. This is the organs. new crew. There's an initiation. Set in stone now, I guess. There's a scene where they initiate Dana and Tarrant, where Zen registers their voices, mm-hmm. which was nice. Oh, man. There's the most humorous line oh. in the story that I thought I thought the story was going to end on this line because it was basically the perfect it ending have a funny line. line though. Callie and Villa get beamed up, and they're, like, knocked out. And then Avon's like, oh, this is Callie. I'm going to introduce you to you to her later. This is Villa. I should probably introduce you to him now because he's in his most agreeable state right now. <laughs> I thought it was going to end on that note, and I would have been like, that's a classic Blake 7 <laughs> ending, but then we get the initiation there scene. Is, there's like a funny line at the end, too. I forget what it was. but I forget what it was, too. Yeah, it was it was another jab at Villa. <laughs> Poor Villa. <laughs> Villa gets and this episode, he kind of deserved it, though. Yeah. But, right, this thing I wanted to mention also is that I've read, since Avon is sort of filling in for Blake now, he becomes more of like, you know, a, a leader or a typical, like, hero character, main character type guy. Tarrant is the one who sort of Fills in for Avon. Fills in for the Avon of Series B and A. A mostly, I guess. Series A, Vaughn. Yeah. And then we have Series Blake, and Series Callie. Callie, and Series Del Tarrant. Sure. Or Dana. Or Dana. Probably Dana. I like we'll Dana have, more than we'll Del. Have to see. We'll have to see. Well, I like Dana as of now more than Del, but Del's only been in one episode. I, so. I like both of them. I, I want to see where they go with both of them. There's a lot of parallels between this and Series A because we don't, you know, get the final Liberator crew till like till episode four. But the there's, first two episodes are like getting the Liberator, setting the crew, and there's a lot of mission. there's a lot of direct similarities between this and Spacefall. Them running yeah. around a ship, people getting killed and stuff, and a mutiny and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. A lot of similar concepts. Right. This would be like, what if Raker joined the Liberator crew? <laughs> <laughs> hey, but I liked Raker. <laughs> Yeah, that would uh, result in some real backstabbing. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you think you think Del Tarrant is just a fake backstabber? I have, we'll have to see where they go with Del Tarrant. I really don't know. I feel like you know more than you're letting on since you and, and Drano <laughs> shared an in joke about watching out for those Del Tarrants on <laughs> for those Tarrants on that episode uh, we did with with Drano. We'll have to see. <laughs> we'll have to see. <laughs> Anyway, speaking of guest appearances, maybe we should explain some of the guest appearances oh, we're going to be right. doing. So this we're season. planning this season to do uh, one, uh, one episode at least with the the guy who runs Making Blake Seven. I don't know if he's on ever Twitter? like officially revealed his name on Twitter. No, and you know what? I kind of feel like like our podcast is going to be like the first reveal of his voice, which is going to be cool. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to give away his name yet. Then, if he hasn't given it away yet, but we're gonna oh, do. I don't even know his name because oh. I haven't seen the oh. email. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know it. That makes me special. <laughs> but Keon doesn't know it yet. But I do. I'm not gonna give it away yet. But we're doing an episode with making Blake Seven, which I believe. Hang on, I'm just gonna check uh, the schedule and find out. As of right now, that's gonna be the harvest of Kairos, which is in how many weeks? I want to check. Three weeks, three right. episodes from now. Yep. And then we're also planning to do one with Jim and Martin of the Crinoid podcast, which right. is a Doctor, Doctor Who podcast. podcast. Because they really like Blake Seven. And with them, we're planning to do Rumors of Death, which is about halfway through the season. So a couple coming up. And then we're thinking about maybe doing a couple more since we're, we're halfway through the show. So there's still, I think, a couple people that we want to try get on the right. show. Before we been trying to get like actors and people who worked on the show, but no success. And that's fine. Yeah, it is fine. But we are trying to do a couple more uh, crossovers before the show ends because, like you said, we're halfway through now and we're kind of running out of episodes to do that. So this season so far, making Blake Seven and Jim and Martin of the Crinoid Podcast. Right. Yeah, so we should explain we're also adding a new segment to the show. Halfway through the show, we're adding a new segment. <laughs> well, I just thought of it randomly. So, yeah. And hopefully it'll be, it'll be pretty fun. Hopefully. So what it's going to be, it's sort of a question trivia segment. Um, we're going to be asking probably multiple choice, pretty mm-hmm. pretty easy, nothing too answer, difficult. Free, free response. Free answer. If it's too easy, it'll be a free response. <laughs> make, make, sure question. Pay, no. make sure you're paying attention. There will be a grade at the end of the podcast. <laughs> no, but it's going to be a sort of a trivia section. At the beginning of each episode, we'll be asking questions about things that happen in the episode. Yeah, um, but like more detailed than the plot summary we give because we give... A pretty pretty general, general overviews. Yeah, overviews. Because right. we tend to also go into a lot of like speculation. Spe- speculation and, and 
literary theory sometimes and arguments yeah. about what science fiction is. We tend to take tangents <laughs> a lot. But the point is that the questions will be more detailed and will like actually require you to watch the episode. Right. And they're going to be things that are like actually in the episode. So, and then at the end of the of our episode, we'll we'll give you the answers. So, just yeah, so something the, hopefully fun mm -hmm. that you can just jot down your answers to the questions and see if you were right at the end. Yeah. So questions at the beginning and then answers at the end. Do you want to give us an example? Because we did come up with yeah, just we, I guess sample questions for this week, or you did you came up with sample questions for this week? Right. So we might ask a question like at the beginning of this episode, Villa pretends to be leading a group of men. How many does he say are with him? And then like we have A through D. So A ten, B thirteen, fifteen, C. 15 or d25 mm -hmm. or or something like the high techs use drug guns with red lights on them but they also have lights on their helmets what color were they and that mm -hmm. would be like that's really easy so that would be like you know a free mm -hmm. sort of answer one yeah so that's kind of the plan just to see if you're paying attention <laughs> or just i mean just for fun like just for fun especially if you haven't watched these episodes in quite a while mm-hmm this show is getting increasingly more complex. This show is more complex than Trust I mean, Your Doctor at this we're, point. We're not trying to like, and it's also more popular. That's why we're more invested in it, to be honest. <laughs> For now. It, this isn't like, how much are you paying attention to us? But like, just a fun thing to see if you remember the Well, episode. yeah, because these questions are not going to be like, in Things episode like, two of Zenith, <laughs> Dylan made a joke about XYZ. <laughs> what was oh, that joke God. about? <laughs> oh, God. Well, hopefully you, you guys out there enjoy it. And if you don't, Send us an email because we do take feedback seriously. Yeah, Especially and if like two show. people ask us to stop doing it, like we'll probably stop. If two people ask us to stop <laughs> and nobody asks us to continue, we'll stop. Because then the prevailing opinion will be stop. So we actually got two emails this week from both from regular correspondents. Our first is from Miss Al Bingham, which I will go ahead and read. Zenith Crew. That would be us two, I guess. <laughs> Here are some thoughts I have as we transition into the new series. Travis, this is like a, a Six heading. Feet this, under. Is, this is like a this is like a heading. Travis, oh, yeah, okay. I was glad to see the end of Travis 2.0. He didn't have the smolder of Travis one. His relationship with Serverland felt weak, and I hated the new uh, streamlined eye patch. Streamlined, huh. I guess, is what you mean. The initial deformed one made Travis much more menacing. That's actually interesting. We never actually really talked about the difference in the eye patch. I know we briefly mentioned it, but we never really mentioned that. We didn't really talk about costume differences at all for Travis, honestly. Because really the eye patch was the big one. I think the suit was pretty similar. But the eye patch, you know, this is a good point actually that we never really mentioned. Travis, Stephen Grief's Travis, the eye patch looks kind of like a moldy piece of cheese stuck to his <laughs> face. And Travis 2.0, it looked like a piece of duct tape. It was really flat. Yeah, and Brian Croucher's definitely still looked janky, but I think they both in a looked way. janky. But yeah, like you said, in different ways. Tra you know, Brian Crouch's was like, it looked janky because it looked kind of cheap, right? And and then, in my opinion, Stephen Griefs looked janky because it, it just looked, looked really poorly put together. It almost looked robotic, like it, mm -hmm. as if it was like a, a robotic eye in terms right. of Stephen Grief. But I mean, obviously it wasn't. It was just a, a literal eye patch, but hey. And I think maybe, you know, your point about the relationship with Serverland feeling weak is because, uh, like we said it feels like a lot of things in this in series B anyway were, were reordered uh, because Travis and Serverland's relationship goes through a lot of ups and downs. They're working together and the next week they hate each other and they're working together and then, you know, it never really gave them time to like really solidify anything between the two of them. Right. Dana is another like heading. I really love the character of Dana, although it's sad to say goodbye to Jenna. The character of Dana breathes fresh life into the series. She is a lot more action oriented than any of the other Blake 7 gals. Just that Simon refuses to play Dana in the audio, audio dramas as she feels that the noble warrior, uh, that's in quotes, role was sexist and racist, something to keep in mind as the character progresses. I definitely think Dana is a great character in Aftermath. What they right. do with her in this episode and in, Vol in Volcano, which we've already watched and recorded, mm -hmm. is questionable. And I'm curious to see where they take this character Right, like I'm curious after, to I'm know curious this. To see, like, where Dana goes after this. Right, I'm curious to see how how overt uh, they get with this noble warrior idea because like, you know even in aftermath that was yeah that was like the kind of conception behind the character but they didn't really like make it, it didn't feel like that was her only character right right she was the daughter of a weapons maker she's lived on this planet her entire life with this indigenous species that wants to kill them it, you know it felt like she had this fleshed out happy backstory. as well yeah she's really trigger happy. But there's that's a, not to say it's not racist or sexist. Right. And there's it just feels like there's more going on with Dana in mm -hmm. Aftermath than there really is in Power Play or Volcano, especially Volcano. Right. But, you know, we got to give at least some credit to the show that that, 
I guess anti credit to the show that that might just be the fact that once again they have She's an ensemble new. of seven characters. It's not going to mm. be possible to focus on everyone every week. True. That's true. And you know we're still really in the f- the formative episodes of series C. I mean we're about a th- fourth of the way actually through series C. But st- you know when it's you say early, it like that, it sounds on. like a lot, but it's only three episodes. So. Right. Definitely something we're going to keep an eye on. And actually, thank you for that piece of information because I didn't actually know that about Gisette Simon. I was actually always curious why Dana was played by someone else on the audio. So that's actually interesting. Hmm. Bye bye, Blake. A lot of people started to make jokes that the show should really change its name to Avon's Five around this time. This was the season when I started watching it and I couldn't work out why it was called Blake Seven for ages. That's actually interesting. And uh, if you'd like to email us, because I actually am curious, because in Volcano, I bring up a point that volcano i feel like is weaker because dana and dell are both new characters and they put them together however if you started watching with series c i propose that possibly that wasn't a complaint you had so i'm actually really curious if you would like to email us back i'm actually really curious to hear your thoughts on the start of series c and and volcano in particular actually i'm I'm really curious to hear what you think about volcano and how that works uh, the character pairings in that work just as a little right. preview also of next week's episode, I guess. Right, because we said in Volcano, or will say next week for anyone listening, mm-hmm. that part of the reason that episode isn't as good as it could have been is because Dana and Dell go down together rather than right. like either Dell or Dana with an established crew member and then, you know, either Dell or Dana mm-hmm. also on the Liberator with right. you know, Villa or Callie or Avon. Or However, if C- Series C was the series you started with, then they weren't necessarily established characters to you. They're all new. So that's why I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on, on Volcano in particular, specifically for that reason, uh, Miss Bingham. And this is the final heading, Season C. I found the season to have more moments of horror than those preceding it. Not jump scares, but more creepy ideas. Hope you enjoy it. Down and safe, Aji. So thank you very much for emailing us. Definitely looking Thanks. forward to Series C. Was off to a good start. Volcano was a bit of a dip, but that's okay. And then that moves us on to our second episode, which, as you may be able to guess, your second email, sorry, not episode, is from good Sorry. old Mr. Sergeant Drano. You mean Sergeant Drano? Every week we make the <laughs> same joke. Pretty sure it's going to get pretty boring soon. Okay. Hey, guys. So, Power Play, otherwise known as Del Hard 6 Del Hard with Avon <laughs> Jens. Is, is this the Christmas episode of Blake 7? <laughs> You wish. Where's my Blake 7 Christmas special? Ah, never happening. (laughs) Good dual plot this episode, especially the Liberator stuff. It's too bad that both of you were spoiled about Tarrant being whodunit. I feel like it has to take something away from your viewing enjoyment. I remember the first time I saw this one, I didn't know Tarrant was the guy until the end. Interesting that even Avon didn't figure it out. Uh, I believe you're referring Mm. to his betrayal in this episode, which I don't think either of us actually knew. I predicted it. I think I said I predicted it. Basically, as soon right. as the first guard died, but I don't think Avon, uh, Avon Keon picked up yeah. on it. I knew Tarrant was joining. I didn't know he was the one killing people. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of not knowing stuff, the first time I saw Aftermath and Power Play, I had no idea that Blake and Jenna were more or less off the show. For quite a while, I simply assumed it was just a matter of time until they were found and rejoined the Liberator. I feel like the series does a pretty reasonable job of keeping that potential in the background, too. I think Dylan will be pleased. That's really good <laughs> to hear, actually. I'm really glad to hear that. So this episode, Villa and Callie are meeting all the nicest, most helpful people ever. Suspicious much? Did section leader Tledig look familiar to you? You might remember him better as Admiral Ozel from The Empire Strikes Back. Wow. Did not nope, recognize him at all. Didn't pick that one up. Hey, we almost got to see the treasure room. Nice callback. <laughs> Keon mentions that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we were so close. Did Villa poop his pants? I'm not sure what that's a reference to. Probably has a brown streak on his pants. Yeah, I mean, he was... Around water and mud and stuff, right? You probably right. got splashed or something, unless it's a larger reference to something else. Tarrant's pretty sharp this episode, and Dana still has her edge, too. Thoughts on the noobs? Mm, I felt Dana was weaker, like we mentioned. Dana's weaker, I think, than in Aftermath. Mm-hmm. Uh, because there's less there for her. It, because it's really a Tarrant and Avon episode, I think. Sure, and and that's fine. We always mention how... You know, specific episodes can focus on specific characters while the rest are sort of delegated to supporting characters in that episode. It just, it does leave a a bad taste in my mouth after having watched Volcano and seeing how weak really Dana is in that one. Mm -hmm. But hopefully they'll they'll be able to come back around and have Dana like actually be cool. Yeah. I'm trying to reserve a lot of judgments on Dana and Del right now just because they're new and I want to give them a couple episodes to get settled in. You know, it wasn't like we were the first episode like, man, Jenna is going to be the best character of this entire show. She's got so much potential, right? (laughs) It took us a little while to get into it, so I'm kind of trying to wait, but I definitely think this episode 
made Tarrant out to be a pretty interesting character. And then maybe in Volcano, we lose a little bit of that. And Dana, I think, is starting to fade a little bit too. But that doesn't mean that that's a permanent thing. It's It could just be a, a, an oversight for the week. You know, you never know. Pretty great scene there at the end when Dana chokes Clay to death while coldly saying, you have failed me for the last time, Admiral. Another great one, seven out of seven. Was that Dana choking Clegg to death? Yeah, I, you know, I don't I can't remember. remember. It was honestly. a week ago. All right, and then he responds once more to... To some of the science fiction the stuff we've been discussing discussion with, yeah. for a few weeks. Which started in, I believe, episode 25, which the, was the keeper. the keeper. And then we continued it last week with Aftermath. And uh, we have a couple more things here in PowerPoint. Back to the topics of sci-fi, hard sci-fi, and sci-fi. Sci-fi, here's a few more cents along with some clarifications. Sometimes I get the impression that you regard any story to be science fiction, in quotes, as long as the story has science in it and yep. is fiction. That's Keon. Exactly. If that is the case, I could be mistaken. I would take issue with that. Well, you could take issue with Keon. That's not my belief. That's <laughs> Keon's. It may be called science fiction, but the actual definition of the genre is generally regarded to be something more than just literally science in a fictional setting. Heck, technically all standard fiction would then be science fiction. Exactly. Since standard fiction is set within a normal world where normal scientific laws apply. Exactly. I would point to the Wikipedia page on science fiction for a pretty good definition of the genre as being a subset of speculative fiction. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll just wait before we... There's, Sergeant Drano writes more, but let's just touch on these one by one because there's a lot to like... Well, let's to just touch here. on this because the next two paragraphs refer specifically to hard and soft sci-fi, which is kind of a different thing. Right. We haven't really talked about the history of like science fiction and where that term comes from. But like during the, I think like thir- 20s, 30s, 40s, with, like pulp magazines and venture magazines and stuff. I forget who this is, but his name is huge. I think the Hugo Awards are named mm-hmm. after him. And I don't remember his actual name. Mm-hmm. But this guy who ran um, one of these magazines came up with this term scientific fiction, right? scientific fiction it was mm-hmm. those two words put together and regardless of so, anything else that's thank like a god, mouthful yeah, yeah thank god that didn't catch on <laughs> but he has this sort of definition his definition of what this thing scientific fiction is he says it combines science with and when he says science he's referring to i'll put the quote um in the show notes i'll have the quote mm-hmm. probably on twitter as oh, well or something. and yeah i meant to put the sergeant trainer's email and keon's response in the show notes last week but i forgot so i'm going to Remember to put that up this week. Right. Those will be on the website if you want to check that out. And I'll put this on there too. But what this guy says is like it combines scientific fiction and stuff that combines like Mm -hmm. the hard sciences, the natural sciences with like uh, adventure stories, like things that really inspire your imagination. And again, I remember last week I said like looking at at things through a science fictional lens rather than ascribing like the mm-hmm. definition of science fiction onto something is something that like newer generations are more okay with because of like how you know when people watch things today like game of thrones or whatever like you're not even thinking when you watch that show or i think most people our generation are like this is fantasy i'm engaging with fantasy right now i'm engaging in this tradition of fantasy because of how like non almost rebellious like there's not that punk aspect to it right mm-hmm. anymore it's just normal whereas like in previous eras uh, basically since this stuff became popular there was some sort of like rebellion like yeah this is science fiction it's against the norm it's out there and there's some sort of rebellious thing involved with it or whatever right so but there's also this thing about the gothic right frankenstein is often i, I mentioned blazing world last week which i'll i'll b- briefly describe it again it's a 1666 book it's really long i think i haven't read the whole thing whatever part of it by margaret cavendish it's about this english woman who goes to this other world called the Blazing World. And she like becomes the queen of that world and stuff. And that's often looked at as the first example of science fiction in the English tradition. Mm-hmm. Some people also point to Frankenstein as the first example of science fiction. English, that is. Uh, I typically and, point to Frankenstein. And but Frankenstein takes is it's it takes heavy inspiration from the Gothic, right? And the mm-hmm. Gothic is this genre that like Again, this goes against what I was saying last week of not like ascribing genres, of like looking at genre as a critical lens, Mm -hmm. because again, the story will be whatever it is, no matter what you call it, it exists, no matter what you call it. But like the Gothic is weird. Normally people don't like, other than maybe like cyberpunk or not even cyberpunk, Mm -hmm. steampunk really Mm -hmm. is the one that did this to some extent, but the Gothic was really started by like one guy, right? There was this, I forget what his name is again, but the guy who wrote Castle of Otranto wrote this book because he felt that 
the novel, specifically this new sort of tradition of the novel that sort of arose possibly in the last couple hundreds of, or not couple hundred, maybe 75 or 100, even 50 years Mm -hmm. in the 18th century, he felt that the realism of those stories uh, took something out of like the story. He wanted to get back to stories where uh, like a giant helmet, because on the fir- that's on the first page of Castle of Otranto, a giant helmet falls out of the sky and kills this guy. <laughs> he wanted to combine the fantastic, basically, with character with the characters of like novels who like you can really get behind, like Robinson Crusoe or whatever, and sort of the realism mm-hmm. of that a lot of novels attempted at that time. He wanted to combine those things because he felt that one like the fantastic detracted from like this new tradition of realism. And the realistic tradition detracted from the enjoyment you can get out of fantastic stuff in a story. So he really, like, actually started this genre intentionally, which is pretty atypical. Genres Mm -hmm. aren't really, like, thought of in that way. They're more, like, trends, really, except maybe the gothic and, again, steampunk. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I mean, it, like, if you want to look at it that way, then... Sure. I I think at this point, again, like I had that whole rant about last week, you can... (laughs) I think it's time to like start looking at these things through a critical lens, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know. I feel like there's just been a lot of melding and mixing of, of genres uh, over the past century, which I think has made it difficult to delineate between things like science fiction and fantasy. I know Sergeant Drainer brings up Star Wars in in, in, in the next in the paragraph. Email. Yep. Uh, and, you know, Star Wars is always something I considered like science fantasy, but you know, that's the thing that's like always been like a trend with movies. It's like, you know, the most obvious way to look at it is like, what's a horror movie, right? How do you define a horror movie, right? Like, what would make up a horror movie? Like, if you ask someone that in, say, like, I don't know, 1963, they're like, oh, it's got to be scary. It's got to be X, Y, and Z, right? It's got to be gory, probably, they would say. got to be gory. But, like, now you look you look at, like, what's considered a horror movie today. Like, Get Out is considered a horror movie. But, like, I didn't find Get Out to be scary there's no real in like the traditional sense. There's no real. There's a little bit of gore. There's a few jump scares, but really yeah. not. That's not the scary part yeah. of it. So it's like you know something like that. It's like I think genres have to this point like evolved, which is why now you see movies being described as like three different things, like The Purge, which we just watched, and the episode on that should be going out tomorrow. Actually, The Purge is sometimes described as a horror movie, but like. You know, one of the articles I read described it as like a science fiction thriller and like then Amazon's categorizations, I think, like categorized it as like a horror thriller. So like, I think there's just a lot of, I guess, degradation of the the boundaries between a lot of things. So like, I think, and I think that's a good thing. I think that's why probably, I think that actually is the reason why we've had such a long discussion about what is sci-fi, because I think at this point, there's just been such a change in, in the creation of work that it's it's blurred the lines between a lot of these genres so it's difficult now to draw like definitive dividing lines between things sure and again another reason why i suggest you not you and like people in general look at things through like a science fictional lens right engage Mm -hmm. with that tradition see how this story fits into that tradition but don't like necessarily define it as something Moving on, I don't find or intend the terms hard or soft sci-fi to be derogatory at all, nor do I feel like one is inherently better than the other. Some of my favorite sci-fi would be regarded as soft sci-fi. Star Wars is probably the best example. Also, my use of the term soft sci-fi is not intended to correlate to the soft sciences. Hmm. I don't believe we said that it well, I did, mean, but we might have, indic- we might have insinuated yeah, that it did. Yeah, I, I did at least. I'm using the other definition of soft sci-fi listed on the Wikipedia page for soft science fiction, i.e. not scientifically accurate, or mm-hmm. at least the focus of a soft sci-fi story isn't on scientific accuracy. Again, right. I would feel like the difference between hard and soft sci-fi deals mostly with the focus of the work, the intention to scientific detail. For example, Star Wars, by and large, doesn't care too much about the details of how things in that universe work scientifically. Its focus yeah, solo, maybe. is more on character and story. Contrast this with 2001 A Space Odyssey, which is quite a bit of focus on the physical laws applying to life in space. Incidentally, 2001 is a great example of hard sci-fi that I disliked. I found it to be very, very dull. On a side note, my own background is mostly within the soft sciences, specifically the soft science of sociology. To my mind, they're called soft sciences because the nature of the issues they deal with tend to not have black or white hard answers, hard in quotes. Soft sciences deal more with philosophy, trends, and probabilities. Soft science questions tend to not have yes or no answers, whereas hard science questions often do. There are people who look down on the soft sciences, but I don't find the term soft science to be 
inherently belittle, belittling, soft science in quotes. It is simply a description of its nature. Again, just my opinion, your mileage may vary. Anywho, always a pleasure. Namaste, Sergeant Drano. Parasociology, Station 7 Adore. <laughs> yeah, that's that's interesting. Thanks for the clarification there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you bring up a lot of good points. I think we did sort of misinterpret what you were saying. And Possibly. I definitely went off on a sort of a tangent about that or rant. But I, I mean, mean, once again, though, I think the, the dividing line between what is hard and soft sci-fi has been blurred over the years. I mean, you consider Star Wars to be soft sci-fi. I assume you're referring just specifically to A New Hope because when you start to look at like expanded universe material, you know, just look at Wikipedia the page for the lightsaber has this whole explanation, this whole technical explanation about how physically a lightsaber would work. And that's drawn from books in the expanded universe. So I don't think you can say as a franchise, Star Wars is a soft sci-fi franchise. There are definitely things in the universe that based on your definition, I think he's talking about the movies in particular. The original trilogy definitely doesn't care much about any of that. Mm -hmm. But you bring up in your first sort of paragraph how any story, you know, could be considered science fiction because physical laws apply. Mm -hmm. And I want to bring up the example that we always bring up, As I Lay Dying, because it's about linguistics. But again, that's like just one critical lens you can take to it. You can look at that story as being about linguistics, but there's also so much more going on in that story. But also, like, I think the way a story, like, thematizes these things is really... Uh, an indicator of what not maybe not whether or not you should look at it through a specific lens but like Mm -hmm. because this story thematizes linguistics so much it's so like easy and uh, almost like necessary and you you do you do well you'd have a lot to grasp onto looking at it through a science fictional lens right other stories maybe don't thematize maybe you know a a real uh story from the realist sort of period Mm-hmm. Yeah, physical laws apply in those stories, but are they really thematizing like any science? Mm-hmm. And they, again, that brings us back to like, what is science? Is it the natural sciences? Is it the hard yeah. sciences? Is it the soft sciences? Is it all knowledge? What is it? I'm actually really glad you, you Drano, clarified what soft and hard sciences is. And actually, we will like your definition of the soft and hard sciences, where hard sciences have a yes or no, not necessarily definitively yes or no, but like I have a slight problem with yes or no, but basically saying soft sciences no, have... Really- I have a huge have, problem with yes or no. <laughs> have, uh, I, I guess, a spectrum of answers, whereas hard sciences typically have, I don't want to say fact-based answers, but tend to have deal with uh, deal with things that are a little more, it's a little easier to put like a hard point on something, I guess is what I'm saying. Sure. It doesn't have to necessarily be a yes or no. I just think that's where I think I disagree. I think a hard science is, yeah, you can put like a point on it in a soft science is like, well, there, there's it's a lot more broad. You get more of a spectrum of answers. Yeah. I, again, like you, I do have some problems with this. I, I like this definition, this clarification of hard and soft science. I do have some problems, and that stems from, like, I guess my problems with the scientific method and how that works and how, <laughs> again, really how, like, glorified that is by a lot of people. But we don't need to get into that. Yeah, no, that's a, a little distance from the conversation. What is science fiction? Anyway, there's actually a couple of postscripts that we'll just go ahead and answer here and then we'll wrap up the episode. P.S. Rumors of Death is coming up in a few weeks. Would you be interested in having me back for that one cracking episode? Would we be interested? Yes. Unfortunately, as we mentioned right before we started these emails, we've actually already got guests on that episode, <laughs> unfortunately, for you, Mr. Drano. But we we are still looking forward to doing uh, Orbit with you again. And if there is another episode that you'd like to be on, be sure to let us know. Like we said uh, earlier, we are trying to get a, a good variety of guests on i think before we end this show right we want to bring i think we want to bring uh, you before know before so- we inevitably decide to expand the show with audios <laughs> i feel like it's going to happen at this point but it, we'll you never see. know uh, you know i think we want to bring a lot of different voices to this podcast i think we don't want it to just be us anymore pps since you asked, for reference purposes, here's a picture of Travis with his giant flip phone and his high pants see attached enjoy i'm going to put that picture on the website right. uh, I'll put it in the show notes and I'm going to bring it up so that we can look at it while we play out the episode <laughs> yeah I haven't seen it it's something we missed so <laughs> oh that <laughs> from the keeper yeah <laughs> he looks really disappointed in the phone in this image actually <laughs> that being said if you would like to email us you can reach us at the doctor at decadentvegetable.com. Questions, comments, concerns, angry rants, love letters, your thoughts on the start of series C and science fiction and whatever else you may be musing about. You can find us on YouTube at Decadent Vegetable. You can find us on Apple Podcasts and Google Play at Zenith, a Blake 7 podcast. 
Be sure to leave a rating if you like the show. Check us on Facebook. Trust your doctor. Like us on Facebook. Also check us on Twitter at TYD Podcast and follow us on Twitter. And next time we're watching Volcano. But until then, the end.